Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nirav Shaw, the director of the Maine CDC. I'm joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Wambrew from Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Wambrew and I are pleased to be with you today to talk about where we are with respect to coronavirus disease for the entire state of Maine for today, Wednesday, May 26th, 2021. We begin today's update on an unfortunate and sad note. Maine CDC has received the report of another individual who's passed away with COVID-19. She was a woman in her 70s from Cumberland County, and her passing marks the 825th death associated with COVID-19 in the state of Maine. We'd like to take a moment to offer her friends, family members, and community our deepest condolences. Overall, across the state, there have been a total of 67,000 294 cases of COVID-19, an increase of 162 cases since yesterday. Cumulatively, 1,989 people have been hospitalized. And right now in Maine, 118 people are hospitalized with COVID. 43 of those individuals are in a critical care unit and 20 of them are on a ventilator right now. Our test positivity rate for PCR tests that are conducted in the state of Maine has now dropped to 1.92%. That's an encouraging sign. The last time we were under 2% for our positivity rate was back in March, March 20th of this year. This is a reflection of what appears to be, at least epidemiologically, low, lower levels of COVID-19 that are circulating in the state, thanks in part to the, due to the high rates of vaccination that we've seen across the state. Speaking of vaccinations, as of this morning, over half of all Maine people have completed their vaccine series. This is the entire state of Maine. Your chances of bumping in to somebody who has completed their vaccine series now are one out of every two people you meet. And if you just zero in on those who are eligible for COVID-19 vaccines, that's those who are 12 and over. About 58% of those 12 and over have completed their COVID-19 series. And of that same group, the 12 and over, over 70%, 70.5% to be precise, have gotten at least a single dose of Pfizer or Moderna vaccine or their sole dose of J&J &J vaccine. The bottom line here is that vaccination rates in Maine continue to show strong progress. And as a result of that, things like our positivity rate and things like our number of COVID cases has start, have started to go down. That said, the number of hospitalizations, unfortunately, remains on the higher side. The recommendation here remains as always. This is a great time, a great day to go get your COVID-19 shot. The COVID-19 shots are safe, effective, freeing for so many people, and free for you. As we go into the summer, we're all looking for ways to enjoy the best summer we can, and getting the COVID-19 shot is a way to eliminate doubt from your life. It takes one thing off the table that you don't have to worry about, namely getting COVID-19. Today, again, is a great day and a great opportunity to go get your shot. So with that, we are going to turn to our colleagues in the media. And the first question for the afternoon goes to Patty White. Thanks very much, Dr. Shaw and Commissioner Lambrew. I've got a question about summer camps. And obviously, Maine doesn't require masks outdoors anymore, but different sectors are being directed to the U.S. CDC for guidance. And the U.S. CDC is telling camps that everyone should wear masks, even outdoors. Does that supersede Maine's policy or what should camps do? Yep. Uh, Commissioner, go ahead. Sure. So we we have moved away from our own COVID-19 prevention checklist that we developed last year, primarily because there was an absence of very specific guidance for our different sectors to really relying on what has been more developed U.S. CDC guidelines. Each of those guidelines will be different for different sectors, and we do urge all of our sectors, including day camps, to follow them. But they... You know, at, at this point in time, we have uh, 
removed the requirement that face masks be worn except in schools and in childcare settings. Uh, we do recommend it to be masks to be worn for those under the age of 12 for whom there's not yet a vaccine authorized, as well as for those who are not yet fully vaccinated. So those are our general recommendations. We posted a general checklist on our website, but we do recommend the day camps look at that USCDC set of guidelines and take them seriously. They're there to protect children, the staff at those day camps, as well as their families and communities. Okay, thanks. Um, and then I've got a question related to vaccine passports. So the head of the Kaiser Family Foundation has suggested that instead of vaccine passports, that vaccination cards be used as proof of vaccination to get into certain businesses and venues. I'd just love to know what you think of that idea. Do you think that would be an incentive to get more people vaccinated? And would it be okay for businesses or employers to start asking people to show their vaccination cards? Sure. I'll just begin by saying I think there's a difference between public private policy and private policy. You know, we've gotten this question many times. Will the state of Maine be developing a vaccine passport? And the answer at this time is no, because it's a challenge to try to figure out how do you operationalize it? How does it work across state lines? How do you protect people's privacy? How does this work in the real world? So there is not such a policy for the state of Maine at this time. There are some sectors, some businesses that may choose to adopt policies that do have different practices for people who are vaccinated versus people who are not. And we just, you know, we will work with them as needed, but we really do think that's a private set of policies and um, are not at this time adopting it as a public policy. Sure. And I think part of the point that um, he was making was that the the cards are kind of, it's different than a passport because people already have them. So it's a lot simpler. Um, I, I don't know if you see that as kind of something easier for people to use or less fraught, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an analog solution uh, mm -hmm. to what has otherwise been proposed as a digital solution in some places. But there may be businesses that opt to ask or recommend that folks bring their vaccination cards before they come in or before they get on a plane or something of that nature, that's an option that they can pursue. Uh, we, we don't have any plans to put into place a digital version of the same thing, but that analog solution, that may be one that works for some businesses. Again, it does require the business to let folks know that they should bring that card with them. It requires folks to have that card with them, and it may get us back into the great lamination debate which we're trying to stay out of. <laughs> Got it, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Patty. Um, over to Chris Costa next. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Hi, Commissioner Lambrew. Um, I just wanted to ask quickly about uh, hospitalizations and available beds. Um, I know you, you mentioned that a second ago that we've kind of seen some increase there. Um, the dashboard had shown that I think as of today, there are 78 critical care beds available. Um, seems like a couple months ago, back in like the uh, November, December, January, when we were kind of at sort of the height of cases in Maine, uh, we had around 100 beds available. And I guess I'm just sort of wondering how to interpret this data. Does this mean, you know, that we're seeing more people with more severe symptoms now? And I also know, have an idea, and I would like you guys to explain, there's a correlation between beds and then the actual staff to staff those beds. So, um, can you just kind of explain how we should interpret this data and what it means for our hospital systems? Yep. I'll begin and then turn it back over to Dr. Shaw. So I think it's important to note that the actual number of people with COVID-19 in hospitals, the numbers on ventilators have not been increasing. They haven't significantly decreased recently, but they're not increasing. We continue to talk on a very regular basis with leaders in our hospitals to assess whether there is indeed a need to worry about hospital capacity. What we have heard is that while there are fewer available resources, that's partly because people are getting back to the normal surgeries and procedures that they did before the pandemic. There is some pent up demand that is happening at hospitals. They're closely monitoring it. But I do think it's important to note that, that those numbers are fairly widely distributed across the state of Maine. There's no single hospital like there used to be, like May Medical Center or Eastern May Medical Center that have a disproportionate number of those cases. We do have therapeutics and options for treatment that we are 
able to deploy to simultaneously, but we've had this higher level of inpatient hospitalizations that has not yet gone down. We have not seen the commensurate increase in deaths, for example, because we have been able to, working with these hospitals, get those people better. But just know we do monitor both the level as well as available. Should there be a need for more available beds, should there be a surge, we have options that we could deploy. Chris, to pick up on the point where the commissioner ended, um, there, 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 how do I frame this? There are, um, when we report the number of available critical care beds, what we are reporting is both the physical bed itself as well as the staffing and the technology to make that a critical care bed. That number is in flux. A hospital, if it were facing an, in, an increase in critically ill patients, can take just about any hospital bed and make it a critical care bed if they staff it appropriately and provide the technology appropriately. And that is a big reason why the number of available critical care beds may change independently of the number of COVID patients who are in those beds. That is to say that number of available critical care beds, that's a dial that we can turn up or turn down based on the number of sick folks who are out there who need those resources. But we have not been in a situation, thankfully, that other states were, where they found their number of critical care beds or ventilators to be in jeopardy. Thankfully, we've always been well below the threshold of when we were starting to get concerned. That being said, Chris, since you raised hospitalizations, I think it's really important for folks to know, as Commissioner Wambrew noted, we still have a lot of folks in the hospital uh, with confirmed COVID-19. Uh, Right now, again, as, as I mentioned, just today in the state, just across the state, there's 118 people. But here's what's more concerning about that. A large measure of them are unvaccinated. We were looking at some of the data this morning at different hospitals in the state. And at, no, at a number of different hospitals in the state, five out of five of their COVID patients were unvaccinated or 12 out of 12 of their COVID patients were unvaccinated. So this is a risk and it's a risk that can happen to you, but it's also a risk for which we can do something about, namely a COVID shot. Today is a great day to get to go get vaccinated and pretty much greatly reduce that chance that you might end up in a hospital. Understood. Um, I did wanna move on to just another uh, area of discussion. Um, there's more focus now on, on vaccinations for smaller populations. We've seen a lot of the mass vaccination sites uh, shift their focus away from large numbers of people and trying to focus on the younger unvaccinated population. Um, what is the main CDC and DHHS doing to kind of support the hospital systems in those efforts? To support uh, the efforts being, Chris, to move uh, vaccines even more toward people where they are? Uh, yes, and, and, and particularly the, the younger populations, I guess we'd probably say under the age of 20, 29 and under. Okay, sure, I can I can start, but this is again something that Commissioner Wamber and I have, have worked uh, quite extensively on. Um, about a week ago, as you'll recall, Chris, we, uh, two weeks, yeah, it was a week ago, we opened up an opportunity for groups that wish to host, to do the work, to host a vaccination event, whether it's a house of worship, an employment site, what have you. If they're willing to do the work to get folks there, we are willing to figure out a way to get vaccines and vaccinators there. And we've started to see uptake uh, from different types of groups across the state, schools, employers, camps, places of that nature that are willing to say, hey, we want to make our site a vaccination site, including up to or down to for people under the age of 30. And, and that's something that we've started doing more earnestly just in the past week to try to bring vaccines even closer to where people are. Understood. And then just the last question, uh, do you know uh, as far as high school sports, I don't want to take away too many other questions from other people. So this will be my last one, but uh, the, the latest guidance on high school sports from the state. And are you optimistic that in the fall, all high school sports, including wrestling and football will be back? Sure. Uh, so we earlier communicated to the main principals association or MPA superintendents and school boards that in light of the increased role that the US CDC has assumed in issuing guidance, the state of the Maine has decided to retire its COVID-19 prevention checklist, including community sports. 
We are grateful to the Maine Principals Association and School Leadership for their partnership to align guidelines on interscholastic sports with those on community sports throughout this past year. Moving forward, we're happy to offer as well um, any sort of input on the Maine Principals Association public health protocols for summer on fall, fall, fall sports if they would like it. As a reminder, school sports must continue to follow Maine's current executive order and school requirements and recommendations that apply when those sports are being played on school grounds and in school buildings, but the Maine Principals Association will have the ability to decide on fall sports this year. Thank you both. Thanks, Chris. Over to Megan at WMTW next. Thank you both for uh, taking my question. It's very similar to Chris's actually. Um, so given that the weather is heating up uh, and a lot of you know unvaccinated kids are still required to wear masks outdoors, whether school or let's say something like Little League, is there really a tipping point between the safety of masking against COVID and the dangers of something like exhaustion or overheating or difficulty breathing, especially on a day like today? So what what is the input in the guidance um, for something like that? Sure, and I, and I probably should have clarified this. The requirement to wear a mask applies in schools for all people irrespective of vaccination indoors, as well as in childcare settings indoors for all people. The recommendation is that people who are unvaccinated, adults or kids under the age of 12, wear a mask, but that's again indoors. We generally moved, follow the US CDC guidance that outdoors is relatively safe so several weeks ago, the state of Maine followed that recommendation and does not require children or unvaccinated people to wear masks outdoors. Well, they might not be required though. Some, some organizations are still asking that kids do that. Mm -hmm. um, so in the event of that, let's say they're outside playing in the game or something, uh, when the weather is really hot and humid as we enter the summer, um, what what's the input? What's the recommendation? You know, I'll just begin by saying common sense. You know, I think we are now in the phase of this pandemic, whereas Director Sasha said earlier, you know, one out of every two people you run into will be fully vaccinated. So we do think we're to the point where parents should do what's right and what makes sense for their own families and their kids. I think a lot of kids have gotten very adept at figuring out like when and where to wear masks. So we do urge people to just you know, when possible, if you're unvaccinated, do wear a mask that will protect you, that will protect other unvaccinated people. Uh, but again, in certain settings, when you're outdoors, when you're running, when you're, you know, doing physical exertion, it probably doesn't make sense to wear a mask anymore. The risk of transmission is low and there are other issues as well. Yep, Megan, I'll only add to that. I think the guidance and the recommendations are similar to what we experienced last summer as well which is ask kids to modulate and monitor their own behavior and their own, the way their own, the way that they are feeling. If they are having difficulty breathing, you know, uh, make sure that they're getting a break. If they can remove themselves from a crowd, take the mask off. But the same things that parents did quite successfully last summer are the same ones for this summer as well. Uh, let me go to Brian Sullivan next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Commissioner Lambrou, just to clarify there on the high school sports, so if I understood correctly, the, the guidance that was there gone, and now if we have questions, we should wait for the MPA to have ruling essentially for high school sports like wrestling or football? Yeah, and we just communicated our views to the Maine Principals Association earlier today. So they may, they may still be working on their own thinking about what they do for fall sports. So, uh, But the bottom line is, yes, I mean, this is part of our going back to the way things were before the pandemic, where... The Maine Principals Association is the governing body for school sports. They will do that again. Uh, we do urge our community sports organizers to look at those USCDC guidance to consider how they can protect their own players, their own coaches, and other participants in community sports. So we do continue to recommend that public health protocols are followed, but we're no longer in the position that we were previously of having requirements for community sports and then trying to make sure that they were synced up with school sports. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shaw, um, 
I guess a uh, question here is, it seems like uh, maybe anecdotally people find themselves in a bit of a state of flux as they go shopping or into indoors and mask, no mask. I guess the question I would pose is, as a fully vaccinated person, knowing that maybe some people are, are not following the guidance and, and are unvaccinated and unmasked, should I feel safe shopping indoors uh, around people who may not be following the rules? The answer is yes, Brian. Um, you know, that, that is just how spectacularly effective the vaccines that we have are. Uh, again, as, as I've mentioned, if anything, we've, we've undersold how effective the vaccines are. If you're fully vaccinated, your chances of coming down with COVID, and even if you come down with it, passing it on to someone else, are quite small. Here in Maine, 99.96%. 99.96% of all of the folks who have been vaccinated have not come down with COVID. So if, you know, uh, so to answer your question, Brian, should you feel safe in that setting? The answer is yes. But not everyone has the same conception of safety. So I think I shared two weeks ago, uh, a, a family member of mine who, who lives back in the Midwest, um, she's my cousin, she's, she's just not, she's not there yet, even though she's been fully vaccinated. Uh, she's got conditions of her own that make her want to be cautious. What's changed from a regulatory perspective is the requirement to wear a mask in all but school and childcare settings. But that doesn't mean you can't wear a mask if you want to. Uh, and, and we just need to recognize as a state, as a society, that not everyone's there yet. And it's going to take everyone their own bit of time to get to that place. And just real quick, lastly, you know, things are getting back to normal a little bit here. So uh, it's a, a real question here. Are hugs and, and handshakes back? Um, for me, I'm just going to speak for me personally. Yes. Uh, I met somebody just the other day and uh, for the first time and I, I reached, I extended my hand to shake their hand. Um, you know, uh, the person I was meeting indicated that they were fully vaccinated, but candidly, even if they weren't, uh, you know, uh, so for me personally, I'm back to I'm back to shaking people's hands, um, hugs. Uh, you know, I think are in the same category. So again, speaking of me, just for me personally, that that's where I'm at. I'll keep that in mind next time we see each other. You got it. You got it, Brian. Thank you. Uh, over to Emily at the Sun Journal next. Hi. Good afternoon, both of you. I I want to ask a question about hospitalizations before I turn to vaccinations. So uh, I've heard from you, Dr. Shaw, as well as some folks over at Central Maine Medical Center that um, young people are in the hospital. More, there are more young people hospitalized. They're, they're sicker, requiring more critical care. Um, and just looking at the data from a, a state level, it looks like the median age from month to month has remained relatively stable. This, this was data as of May 9th. So in, in your experience, are these hospitalizations among young people more concentrated in certain areas rather than a, a statewide rise? Well, um, well, so there's one or two notes there on, on the, some of those data, Emily. Um, one is that in many, not, not uniformly, but in some instances, when a, an individual is critically ill, they may be moved to a hospital in Bangor or in Portland as opposed to being in a smaller regional or community hospital. And so that's just gotta be a consideration you think about when you take a look at those numbers. Uh, but no, overall, we have not seen, leaving that piece aside, we have not seen significant regional variation in hospitalization rates or in terms of the age breakdowns of who's been hospitalized. You make the right point though, Emily, which is, Overall, the average age as a state and in certain hospitals of those who have been hospitalized has trended downward compared to pre-vaccination. Okay, thank you. And then moving to um, vaccinations, um, in terms of the, the Pro-America Mobile Vaccination Unit, I, if I recall correctly, in the original uh, press release, it, it said that um, after Lewiston, it was gonna to go to other places in central and Western Maine. I know it was in Freeport and now New Gloucester, which if we're keeping to a strict definition of central and Western Maine, I would consider that outside of it. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, is there a, was there a reason that it went outside of those sorts of areas? And, and second to that, um, and kind of connected there, uh, 
I, I noticed that in terms of the uh, number of vaccination sites to compare to lowest vaccine uptake, the Lewiston and Auburn area seem to have um, a lot of opportunities to get vaccinated, but not uh, but low vaccine uptake. So is the CDC shifting its strategy in those areas? So we'll, we'll start with the former uh, piece about Promerica. You know, we've we've worked with Promerica to find locations in the state that had lower than average vaccination rates, or and or a lot of people, just a high number of people who needed to be vaccinated. And that's been the organizing principle we've used, not just for the Promerica site, but for other sites as well. Uh, right now, of course, it's, it, it's, it's heading back toward the Androscoggin County area for the Lisbon area, because again, an area of need where there's a number of folks that need to be vaccinated. That's been the guiding principle throughout. Uh, in terms of where we, you know, to increase uptake in the Androscoggin County area, uh, we think that some of the strategies that we've deployed and have talked about, such as allowing groups to come together to organize vaccine clinics, and then what we can do is to help them pair up with a vaccinator group, be it an EMS agency, be it an independent pharmacy, what have you. We think that'll be a strategy that will help. Indeed, this week in the Lewiston area, we are revisiting and visiting for the first time different areas such as houses of worship, where again, they've come together and said, we've got congregants who would like to be vaccinated we'll, and we'll do our part to get folks there. I'll just say, add one little point, which is, you know, we have been tracking our shot to get outdoors incentive program, which uh, as a reminder, anybody who gets their first dose between now and Memorial Day, you too could get one of five different incentives, all being gift card, a free ticket to a Sea Dogs game or Oxford Plains Speedway race, going to the main wildlife park, going to a main state park, or getting a free fishing or hunting license. We have found so far, Androscoggin County may be in the lead in terms of the percentage of his population that have taken this up. So we're gonna keep monitoring that and we'll put out some more data next week when the program is done. But 75% of the people who have taken up these incentives so far are under the age of 50. And again, a fairly high take up in the Androscoggin County area. Okay, thank you both. Great, thanks Emily. Uh, over to Joe Lawler next. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, my first question is um, just kind of assessing where we're at in, in, the, in the pandemic um, with the lower numbers that we've seen uh, over the past week. And then also now you were uh, mentioning the, the reduction in the positivity rate. Um, are we starting to see exponential decay in Maine? And al also, um, how will we know when we've gone from the pandemic phase to the endemic phase? Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Joe. Um, so nationwide, we're certainly in the exponential decay phase. In Maine, I, um, I, I haven't run the, the curve against the equation that sets forth exponential decay to be able to give you a mathematically verified answer, Joe. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna hedge just a little bit and say, it, it looks like it, but you know, um, check back in with us in about 24 hours when I'll, I'll, I'll try to run that to see if we have met that criterion. But nationwide, we certainly are. In Maine, it, it appears that way, but let's not get too uh, attached to that particular label that's just a curve that looks a certain way according to a math formula. What is undeniable is that things like new daily cases, as well as um, the number of new positive results per day has started to go down. Largely, we think a function of vaccination rates. That's a good thing overall. Um, in terms of the shift from things like pandemic to endemic, you know, et cetera, similar view there, Joe. Um, certainly there's been an easing, but uh, I don't want I don't want to get attached uh, prematurely to a label where we shift from one to another. In any event, that's really not a a determination that a state public health department would make. That's really something that the U.S. CDC or perhaps even the World Health Organization would dive into and weigh in on. Okay, my thank you. My follow up question. Um, 
uh, for uh, Gene Lambrew is you were uh, uh, talking about the incentive program and um, with the uh, 3,600, I don't know if there's a new update of numbers today, but I think yesterday we had 3,600 uh, or so people taking advantage of that. Uh, is that meeting your expectations in terms of how many people are signing up for the incentives? And, um, you know, we noticed that the, the, the total number of vaccinations has been declining. And, and so it, is the incentive program uh, do, doing its job or do you think it could do better? And if you could just uh, uh, explain that. Thank you. Sure. So we are up to 3,848 people who've gotten one of these incentives. We will do a quick evaluation of it um, as soon as the program is done on Tuesday. Tuesday, again, March, May, May 31st is your last day to do this. So we will take a good hard look to see what worked, how did it work? Should we continue to do it? Should we do something different? And what comes next? I think we've been looking also across the nation because different types of options have popped up, be it you know some states like Ohio are going big on lotteries, Others are offering tuition remission and other types of educational incentives. Others are doing a lot more food and drink and other types of incentives. And others are just doing more straight up cash. So we are looking hard at what, what we're learning from all those states to see what, if anything, Maine should do next. But as I said previously, what we're trying to do is align these types of incentives with other healthy activity. I mean, you're talking to the public health team and our goal is to promote health mental health, physical health, as well as prevention. And so we're hopeful that when we're done with this little incentive program, we can take a good hard look, quickly assess, has it worked, what works well? And if it, if it is working well, we'll figure out a way to continue it. If there's an alternative, we may do that too. Thanks, Joe. Over to Amy Brown next. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Following up on the uh, question about vaccine cards or passports, aside from this being an incredible political hot button issue, once the vaccines are fully authorized, how would a system like that be any different than the state requiring immunizations for school children? Well, um, first of all, on the, sure? on the, yeah. I'm sorry, can I just make sure I understand the question? Were you asking? about the vaccine passport being different if the vaccine is fully authorized? I just want to make sure we're answering your question. Well, yeah, following up on Patty White's question originally about vaccine cards and passports, um, recognizing that there's a difference between the immunizations now that are required for school children because they're all fully authorized versus the vaccines now for COVID are not. But once they do become fully authorized, what other impediments are there besides the fact that there'd be a huge political backlash and there has been already in other states, what would make having a uh, system for showing your vaccine card or a vaccine passport in Maine any different than the state, what the state already does in requiring immunizations for school children? Sure, I'll just say quickly that, you know, we and immunizations for school children is uh, being implemented now, but for a while there's been in healthcare facilities, for example, requirements that workers get vaccinated for certain types of diseases so they can do their job. Right. And we have not to date seen a need for a vaccine passport for flu vaccine or other vaccines that are required in different types of settings. I mean, I'm going back to what Director Shaw, Shaw said, there's a digital version and an analog version. And we have over the years been able to figure out how to make do without some sort of technological solution. When you travel, for example, there are some countries that require you to have proof of different types of vaccination. So this is not new in the world of public health to have immunization, proof of immunization be required in certain settings. So we don't anticipate should we get to a point where some organizations, and for example, we do know cruise ships this year will be requiring uh, gas or passengers to show proof of vaccination. We know certain types of higher education, colleges and universities will be doing the same. So we do expect that people will figure it out. Uh, let me this, turn to uh, could I, can I ask another question and also a follow-up to this one? 
I, so to follow up with this, so, but the state doesn't see a role in the state overseeing this as is done in schools. Is that, that's what you're saying, Commissioner Lambrew, that this will be a case by case basis done by private organizations if they feel it would be useful to just verify vaccine status? At this point in time, yes. Okay. Um, and then also following up on a question that Brian asked, uh, he was asking about people, uh, vaccinated people being mixed in with potentially unvaccinated people in settings like a, a retail store. And Dr. Shai, you were saying that that's safe at this point. You feel like that's safe for the people who are vaccinated. How about smaller settings like an office with several people inside or a, uh, a home even for a mixed group of people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated. Is that also continue to be uh, something that's considered safe for people who are vaccinated, but the people who are not vaccinated need to be concerned or how, how, how does that without any distancing work? Yep. So what we know about the effectiveness of the vaccines in the real world is that they do a spectacular job keeping those who are fully vaccinated safe from contracting COVID-19 and even in those rare instances, we've had about 326 now in Maine, where out of hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of people who have been fully vaccinated, even where they do happen to get diagnosed COVID, their symptoms are mild and almost very rarely it, it, do they end up in a hospital. So the vaccines are doing exactly what they were designed to do. Now, not every situation is alike, Amy, and so um, in a grocery store setting where the interactions are fleeting, uh, maybe just a couple of seconds, it's a, a lower risk setting, but that may not be the case for everybody. A home or the office may be a little bit different. But even there, the vaccines have shown in real world settings to be remarkably, remarkably effective. So overall, in the scope of risks that are out there, the risk to a vaccinated person from those types of exposures is low. But Every workplace is different. And there are difficulties, as your prior question noted, of de determining who's vaccinated and as well as different workplaces, making sure they've got the physical layout ready to go that keeps that risk low, the ventilation system and all of those things. And so for that reason, many workplaces in Maine, including my own, may continue to require that everyone, even if fully vaccinated, wear a mask so we can keep that risk as low as possible for everyone. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go to Patrick Whittle next. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to put some uh, put some data in front of you. Um, so uh, Johns Hopkins has uh, told us that the seven day rolling average of daily deaths in Maine has risen over the past two weeks from one per day on May 10th to a little more than 2.7 per day on, uh, I believe, Monday of this week. Is, there, is, is the state aware of that? And what kind of factors could be, uh, could be causing the, the daily deaths to tick up a bit when the other metrics are all going in the other direction? Yep. Uh, Patrick, I, I have seen a similar trend. And let me start by just noting, uh, as we have, for over a year that every single passing associated with COVID-19 is sad and it's a saddening moment when that happens and it's a loss for our state. In this situation though, Patrick, what, what I think is critical to keep in mind is that deaths are one of the, what are so-called lagging indicators of COVID-19. That is to say, when you have an uptick in cases, you see the uptick in cases first, and then about eight to 12 days thereafter, an uptick in hospitalizations, and then several days thereafter, sadly, an uptick in deaths. The opposite thing happens when you're seeing a decline. You start to see a decline in cases and positivity rates, and then at some point thereafter, a decline in hospitalizations, and then at some point thereafter, a hopeful decline in deaths. So these things take a little bit of time to catch up with one another. We hope that that is part of what's going on here. The other thing to bear in mind, Patrick, is, and again, this is not intended to minimize the loss that people feel in the families, but there is a, there's a, a kind of a flip side of what's called the law of large numbers, which is sort of informally called the law of small numbers, 
When you're dealing with small numbers, as we thankfully have been in Maine when it comes to deaths from COVID, small shifts can look quite large when, in fact, they are thankfully somewhat minimal uh, in, in terms of the real number of folks. So it, it sounds like it could largely be a, a facet of, uh, of reporting lag then is sort of part of what we're looking at. It's, it's actually not, it's, it's partly reporting, but it's also just epidemiological lag. Uh, folks get COVID first, then some fraction end up in a hospital, and then a smaller fraction may end up passing away. And so some of that is a function of, of just the natural history of the disease. The last thing I'll mention there, Patrick, that's gotta be kept in mind is, as you're aware from time to time, our team of epidemiologists scours the vital records data to make sure we haven't missed anybody who, who may have passed away from COVID-19, but just wasn't part of our case set. And we did that reporting about a week ago, uh, uh, eight, eight days ago, um, and that would have also accounted for this increase in death rates, even though our overall case trends are going down. Those deaths occurred weeks and weeks and weeks ago, but they're just now being picked up because we're trying to get the most clear and complete picture we can. So it's, it's not necessarily alarming or unexpected that the caseload is going in one direction and the daily deaths are going in another. Not at this time. It's still deeply saddening, and we, we, we mourn the loss of those individuals. But at this time, it's not a cause. It's not sending up any alarm bells. Got it. Um, I wanted to touch one more time on uh, the subject of passports. Uh, if, if I understand what Commissioner Lambert was saying earlier, it, it sounds like uh, private, private entities, private businesses that operate in the state are, are able to um, ask for verification if they if they want it, but the state is not playing any kind of a role in that. Is that essentially what the position is right now? You know, we do urge you know, employers, organizations that are interested in these policies to check to make sure you know is consistent with their own organizations, bylaws, and the rules that govern those organizations. There may be some settings where there may be some limitations on that, including potentially the need to make accommodations for certain individuals. So we do urge people to just take a good look before you implement that policy in these different types of settings. But again, we've seen across Maine, there are some settings interested in implementing uh, that type of policy. Uh, we support them if that's their interest. But at this point in time, there's no state of Maine policy that would have one set of rules for people who are vaccinated and different set of rules for people who are not. So if the if private entities want to come up with some kind of a policy, they should just make sure they're square with existing laws before doing it? Yep. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick. And the final question for the afternoon goes to Jessica Piper. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, the main legislature is set to come back next week, and some members are protesting the, the continued mask requirement there. Can you just talk about from a health perspective, who is safe to not wear a mask at this point and who should continue to wear one? Sure. Um, you know, right now, there are two questions that I urge folks to keep in mind as they are thinking about whether they need to be wearing a mask. The first question is, are you fully vaccinated? And if so, then there are a lot of places where you may not need to wear a mask indoors. The second question, though, is where are you going? And if you are going somewhere that itself requires the wearing of masks indoors, well, if you're going to their house, then those are the rules that apply. If Whether it's a workplace, whether it's a friend's house, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a retailer, that's the governing set of rules that applies. All right, um, and then switching gears, um, the some notes from a recent meeting from the vaccine planning work group said that um, vaccine wastage may increase as providers, more providers are receiving the vaccine. And I was wondering if you had any numbers on that and have more vaccines been wasted or expired in the past few weeks as demand has been slower? We, we haven't seen it yet, although we are keeping a very close eye on this, Jessica. Um, so nationwide, uh, I, I had the chance to get up to date on this issue not long ago. And nationwide, 
Um, thankfully, the rates of unused or so-called wasted doses has been quite small. Again, nationwide, not Maine-wide, nationwide, it's been about 0.52% as of Monday uh, of all the, the COVID vaccine that has gone to waste or was unused. Uh, that's thankfully a very good and favorable number. But as you note, there are some concerning signs on the horizon. And I know that the US CDC and our federal colleagues are keeping tabs on that. Uh, what we here in Maine have done is work with providers to move doses around. So if a provide, as we've always done, if a provider has a series of doses that are expiring soon, we try to move them to a place that can use them sooner and then swap those around. So we haven't encountered that problem, but it's a concern. Uh, that is one reason we're taking a look at things like our use policies to make sure that we don't disincentivize vaccinating and end up with more wasted doses. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Jessica. And Commissioner, that was the last question for the afternoon. Uh, let me just check with you. I'll turn it over to you before we adjourn for the afternoon. Anything else so, on your end? Uh, I'll just say quickly that, you know, as we earlier were talking about, you may, when you're traveling this summer, bring your vaccine card. There may be some places where they ask you about your vaccination, but more importantly, you might wanna also bring your mask. As a reminder, we are saying that there are some businesses, some places, including some of our different office buildings where irrespective of your, your vaccination status, those, those establishments have chosen to maintain the mask requirement for the time being. So we do urge people to be respectful of those organizations, the people who work there, they may have circumstances that may call for uh, the continued use of masking, including and especially those organizations where there's a lot of kids. You know, as a reminder, it is just not an option yet for children under the age of 12 to get a COVID-19 mask, uh, a vaccine. So we do urge people when they're around young children, you may not need to for your own safety, but it may be a nice thing and a kind thing to wear a mask when you're around a bunch of kids. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. And to our colleagues in the media, thanks for your questions this afternoon. And thank you all for taking some time out of your afternoon to hear the latest. We hope everyone has a great day. We look forward to chatting with everyone next week. As always, please be kind and take care of one another. We'll talk again soon.